And so this week, I have a very special guest, and we're going to be talking about being prepared. Right? Preparedness beats paranoia. And it is my utmost pleasure. And please give him a big round of applause in the comments of this feed. I please help me in welcoming Mr. Mark Herrera, Director of Education and Life Safety at IAVM, former police sergeant and SWAT officer. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Fanny. To, to thank you. And I really appreciate it. I'm honored to be a part of your day and also your audience. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. So Mark, tell me a little bit about what you do and tell me about IAVM. It's the International Association of Venue Managers. Right? It is. Before we go there, Fanny, I just want yeah. to thank you for what you do as well, because oh. as a consulting firm that helps business owners and professionals create social media content and video strategies and plans. And I've been very fortunate to sit in on some of your interviews. <laughs> you do a phenomenal job in, in, in guiding those conversations. So wow. uh, again, you're such a valuable resource to, to the entire industry. So thank, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. So yeah, tell us a little bit about your career. And uh, for those of you out there, please look him up on LinkedIn. I'll pro up his profile, but tell us about your career, Mark. Well, I, I, I don't, you know what, th thank you. I, I, I don't want to put people to sleep. And first of all, <laughs> I welcome no. everyone. Most importantly, I hope everyone is doing well under the current conditions. You, yourself, your teams, and your family. That's most important. I have, um, just to give you just a brief background, about 20 years, of, a little over 20 years of law enforcement experience and, and security and safety compliance at a supervisory level. I am now, uh, when I retired, I was fairly young. I was 38, Fanny, when I retired, I started when I was 18, 19 years old. Yes, <laughs> just a young right? pup. <laughs> just a young pup, right? And and still am, or so I think. Um, yeah. I retired, and then I went to the Department of Homeland Security, where my job there was to train armed personnel as a firearms instructor and a defensive tact instructor on how to, how to regain control of hijacked aircraft when it goes under air piracy. Wow. And, and while I was there, I taught uh, the mindset. That's, that's what we talk about understanding behavioral patterns that are not conducive to an environment, yeah. how to interject to diffuse and remove those from your environment. So that was huge there. And then I was picked up by the International Association of Venue Managers, where for IAVM, I oversee um, um, the Academy for Venue Safety and Security. Mm -hmm. uh, here is where I teach the situational awareness, the mindset training uh, that, that's aimed at giving venues the tools to be safer and more secure. Uh, and again, I do the training that emphasizes on exceptional focus, performance, and control in extreme situation and risk mitigation through guest service interjection. So yeah. there are about 300 of those live trainings, uh, Fanny, and then oversee the educational with such an awesome education team with the International Association of Venue Managers. And you had asked me this question earlier, what is IVM? And basically, yeah. IVM is an association and, and uh, they have significant influence over a global industry. Um, we're simply there to provide advocacy, training, education to the entire industry of all the different sectors and all the different venue types. So mm. we're talking about performing arts, convention centers, theaters, arenas, stadiums, amphitheaters, fairgrounds. Wow. All of which have taken a hit right now during the pandemic, right? That, that is correct. Uh, mm. So we're actually uh, very instrumental with our restart and recovery task force. Yeah. Um, led by a couple of two industry professionals um, uh, and also uh, in developing what are those recovery, what's the recovery going to look like and what do those yeah. risk guides look like? So we're building and developing those guides for all public facility assemblies. Awesome. Thank you. And we're going to get into that a little later around safety. But uh, first, I want to dig a little deeper into your career, Mark, because it's <laughs> when I first saw your profile, it kind of blew me away because you literally went from a police sergeant and SWAT officer, very <laughs> like a whole other world, right? All about keeping us safe, but also a very challenging world. And then from there, you went to human resources, 
right? HR. And then from there, now you're into education and event safety and management. And a lot of my audience are job seekers, people in career transition. And I'd love for you to share your story of how you kind of navigated each of these different phases of your life. Um, tell me more about that, please. Absolutely, uh, Fanny. And it's it's been very interesting because I was yeah. very fortunate and blessed. Let me, let me just say that I'm a derivative of great people. Okay. Mm. I, you know, I have aligned myself with some of the best people in the world. You know, when I went from law enforcement to HR, yeah. HR, I'll tell you what, one of the best managers that I have ever been exposed to was in the oil and gas industry. Uh -huh. right? I mean, I, I learned so much from him and, 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 and my boss at the time, Robert Segura, so I started handling all of the HR related functions and handling all of the HR investigations as it pertains to title seven violations. Right. Yeah. Well, I completely went into a whole different role. So here's, you know, when, when you, we talk about individuals that are transitioning and yeah. here's my advice, you know, whether under the current health crisis or we've had massive layoffs or yeah. to find another opportunity, I say, discover your passion. You know, mm. researching the types of careers that center around your passion, because that, that's what I do. What is it that you really want to do? And like I told my son, my son, Ryan, I said, you know what? He, one day he said that I don't think I can do that. And I said, let me explain something to you. Can't never could and never will. Right? <laughs> he is great a advice. Leader. He's such a solid leader and he's a captain within his department. But he took that advice to heart. And again, we're limiting ourselves. If we think that we can't do something, well, then we won't be able to do it. You won't be able to accomplish. So don't worry if you're feeling a bit um, unsure or insecure going into another into another position or seeking another career opportunity. Yeah. Don't be afraid to take that chance and that risk, because I'll tell you mm -hmm. what, no one knows everything that they need to know going into a certain job or a certain position. Yeah. But you have the resources available to guide. So when I transitioned from DHS Fanny to the venue industry, there was much I didn't know. But what I did do was align myself with industry professionals within mm. the event that guided me along the way, so that I could leverage my security right. skill to to assist to assist the industry in secure, right. effective environments. Oh, that's great! <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that. I, I was just gonna say, like, you know. It, it kind of leads into my next question of, you know, some of your advice for job seekers, right? You already mentioned find your passion, uh, align yourself with experts in the field. Any kind of other words of wisdom or advice that you would have for job seekers out there right now? Absolutely. Uh, I always say that my advice is simply learn and understand your new environment. Leverage mm -hmm. your that to assist your organization, your new career opportunity and meeting its objectives. That's key. And one yeah. of the real keys to success to successfully changing careers will yeah. be networking ability. Ah, uh, yes, absolutely. How yeah. have you used your network to kind of build your career, Mark? I'll tell you what. I've reached out to a lot of individuals within the different. When I went into an HR role, I reached out to HR professionals that could assist me and mentor me and yes. guide me along the way. And I had a great mentor with Robert Segura. I mean, mm -hmm. this individual guided me in the right direction. Right. To include Benny, Benny Ball. These two guys were the catalyst in allowing me to transition from from law enforcement into the private sector. And mm -hmm. that. So the mentoring is is critical. It's key. And it is so important. Uh, mm -hmm. that you leverage that. Awesome. So just for you, all of you out there, find your passion, line yourself with leaders and experts network and definitely do your research and homework. Right. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Now, I mean, one thing that you, I mean, have obviously been a lot of sticky situations and difficult situations, right? Especially as a SWAT officer, right? That's like the, the epitome of, of law enforcement in terms of challenges. And, you know, we talked a little bit around how do you think in those kind of stressful situations and those kind of fearful and uh, situations, right? You have a certain methodology around decision making when we're in these stressful, difficult situations. Can you share that with the audience as well? 
I can. It is a challenging environment. You have to be a little bit crazy to be a point man on an entry team. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I certainly team. don't have that kind of courage. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, but I will say this. Many times we're a challenge to make very difficult decisions because we fear um, the unknown. I went through that. And, and the mere fact that we don't want to fail. You know, no yeah. one wants to fail. I've had to make some, some very difficult decisions along the way. Some worked, some didn't. Yeah. So it's and I almost it's like through IABM and obviously it is my goal to continue to provide training to the entire industry on on those topics that we discussed early. Yeah. So that that the industry can make difficult decisions without having to put a lot of thought process into it. But I'll be honest, it uh, I've had some challenging times uh, as even as a tactical officer. And but you know what? Again, we fear the unknown, but you mm. got to make certain decisions and that's where i always say fall back on your training because the training is what's going to guide you in, mm. in in that direction that's going to inoculate you to the conditions that will that you need to make solid decisions behind and stand behind them mm. so when you're in those situations though like i mean you're you're or at least my heart would be like pumping like crazy like we're, we're full of adrenaline we're just you know we're obviously scared right like how do you even get your brain to kind of like process things and and kind of logically assess something and then make a decision from there? What can you maybe take us through like a, a scenario that you've been through and and how your your thought process comes about or in that? Well, uh, from a security perspective, I can tell you this. I yeah. So so mental preparation was always the key. If you've never been involved in certain conditions, right? And I always say. Uh, you know, the idea is to make the unknown familiar, right, mm. in a controlled environment. And yeah. I always say that one of the key things, especially for, for law enforcement, and not just law enforcement, anything we, we do is reality-based training. Because what you're doing with reality-based training is you're placing individuals in a controlled environment to actually see a situation. And now you're going to have a plan of action on how uh, to mitigate risk, mm. how to handle that situation effectively, yeah. With, with a positive resolve at the end, resolve at the end of the day. So what we're doing is you're inoculating. For me, it was how do I inoculate myself to all of the different conditions that I could encounter, and yeah. and we have three plans of action so that I don't have to put a thought process behind it, and I can respond immediately to that environment. And yeah. so that's how I focus, and that's how I train. Is I have built so many scenarios in my mm. mind, Fanny, that I have yeah. an action plan for each one. If that makes uh, sense. It does. Because then you're transferring. You're not having to think right on the field and having to come up with an option right in the field when there's all these other conditions. You've already thought through all these different scenarios and you have like a plan of attack depending on the scenario. And I guess that that's why we, we named our show today <laughs> Preparedness Beats Paranoia. Right? Well, okay. and, and that's, that brings up a good point, Fanny. See, you, you mentioned two things, first of all. Somebody says, well, too much safety and security or too much of one thing builds paranoia. And I say, no. If you have the tools to do your job, you beat paranoia. If you're prepared, that beats paranoia at the end of the day because I'm giving you the tools to effectively deal with the situations that you can encounter. Yeah. So if you don't have those tools, that's where people get caught on their heels, can't make a decision. And I always say, hesitation and complacency go hand in hand and your inability to make a decision during critical situations can ultimately have an altering effect of yourself or others that you are responsible for protecting at the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. You want to get close. Think about this for a minute. When you do the same thing every single day and expect the same outcome and all of a sudden an environment, a condition yeah. protects itself, what does it do? You downplay the situation and you don't have the ability to make a quick decision on how to effectively handle that. So mm -hmm. that creates the hesitation. Yes. We need to avoid that. Ah. And when you make these critical decisions or when you encounter something that's very uncomfortable, you said it a while ago, Fanny, is it creates certain physiological effects that prevent yeah. you from responding. So when you have a heart rate spike because you're emotionally attached to something, it causes what is called cognitive impairment. And I know yeah. you're going to protest here a little bit later, but yeah. this cognitive impairment does. It hinders your ability to utilize good sound judgment, right? Mm. Because you've never worked to that condition. And so because you've had that heart rate spike or your respirations are up, 
what what people try to do is overcompensate with their actions so that they feel normal again. Yeah. Well, that's where you start getting into some gray area and problem areas because mm -hmm. you've never been inoculated to those types of conditions enough to mitigate it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then to your point of like sometimes that that one second or five seconds of hesitation could cost people's safety and lives, right? And so it's minimizing as much hesitation as possible. And we have a great question, Ashley, Mark, from Jim Ramsbottom. Quick shout out to Jim, who's an amazing writer. If anyone needs any writing done, please hit up James, Jim Ramsbottom. But uh, Jim has a great question here. He said, fall back on training, obviously awesome. Any other tips for minimizing fear or obstacles? and maximizing assets. That's what a, would you say to that? Oh, Jim, that is a, such a great question. Look, um, minimizing fear is placing people in those conditions and those situations, right? And I always say, if you can't be in that actual situation, which you don't want to be, you mentally prepare and visualize the, those situations and those conditions. Mm. Training, we'll talk about here in a little bit, training is critical. When you talk about the two parts of the mind, the conscious and the subconscious part of the mind, Look, the subconscious part of the mind, they usually call it the, the dumb part of the mind, but it's not. It's the irrational part of the mind, but it's always the information that you store in there. It stores, you're able to recall about 60% of the information that's in there. It's always subject to recall. It's kind of opposite of the, of the conscious part where you see things for what they are. Yeah. And I would say that the subconscious is basically just saying, hey, it's the irrational part of the mind, but it's so valuable and so important as it pertains to training, because what you put in the subconscious part of the mind, whether it's through reality based training or mental preparation, visualization, you're always subject to recall those conditions when you encounter a certain environment or condition that you that, that you prepared for. Wow. Thank you. I love how your your brain just like <laughs> analyzes all these things and like just I, I guess it's the geeky engineer in me, Mark, because I always love how like people explain things in a very process oriented, thoughtful way. So thank you. I love that answer. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, let's get into a bit of what you do for the, uh, the International Association of Venue Managers, right? Because right now, I mean, we can't go to conferences or events or watch football or watch baseball. I mean, there's, there's, well, in the stadium at least, right? We can watch it on TV. But um, where do you see kind of the future of events and, and venue safety um, in this COVID world that we're in right now? That is, that is a good question, Fanny. So let's talk about this. You know, first of all, uh, the event venues will be changing to help, you know, keep attendees and staff safe as we move yeah. forward. Really, when, when, when the event industry went dark because of, of this health pandemic, we had to immediately, as an advocate for the entire industry and under our great leadership, we had to figure out how we were going to get the industry back on its feet as we currently work through this health pandemic. The reality of the event industry is, is one of an unrelentingly disruptive change, obviously, as we know. Huge, it's yeah. And it's happening at such an unprecedented pace. So venues of all types have to successfully adapt and operate under a set of rules and expectations now that are constantly in flux and based on the current health crisis. And the challenge of this disruption, as we all know, has posed an economical and physical risk. But out of it, we will see how resilient the industry is. And we're going to embrace those growth opportunities. And so IAVM, having significant influence in the global industry, we had a civic duty to assure that we provide a safe, secure, and healthy environment within yeah. all public uh, facilities where crowds assemble. So. Yeah. That was so important to understand what is it that we need to do to get the industry back on its feet. And we went about it in several, in several different ways. Okay. Can you give us maybe like a, a few examples of some of the changes that might be coming about or, or things that, that are now in place because of it? Absolutely. So one of the things that we've done is it's so important that in order for, we will never circumvent and go around the science of what's going on. Yes. Our events are going to be focused on data, not date. So yeah. driving our events on data, not date at the end of the day. Mm. What we did is we had to figure out what are we going to put in place to actually allow people to feel comfortable going back into those environments. So what yeah. we 
is IAVM has partnered with the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council. It's considered a division of one of the leading trade associations for the cleaning industry worldwide. It yeah. helps, it, and through this partnerships, all venues can apply to a performance-based accreditation program that basically helps facilitate, demonstrate that they have the work practices, procedures, and protocols. Yeah. Basically prepare, respond, and recover from outbreaks and mm -hmm. pandemic as it pertains to deep cleaning and sanitizing. That's so, awesome. so there's like a certain level of standards that has to be met to get those certifications. It does, yes, yeah. that's correct, Fanny. So it's like about a 20 one step process through GBAC mm -hmm. and Risk Advisory. advisory. Yeah. We're working with the, a couple of task forces that are, are led by a couple of industry professionals as well. Mm -hmm. We coordinate this. And so now all of the venues are going to be able to go through a, an accreditation process on deep cleaning and sanitizing. So think about this. Now, what we've done is we're working closely with the scientists that are giving us guidance on what needs to mm. go into the venues to yes. these people that are attending events, right? Yeah. That is critical and that is important because what that does, a couple of things, it emphasizes on the number one asset, protecting people. Yes. You know, I always say people first, right? So we got to protect people that attend these events. Okay. Second is protecting, protecting these venues from gross negligence. What do you mm. feasible to protect people that attend these events? And I'd say that that is, uh, you know, that's a, that's a reasonable effort to say, hey, we're trying to protect protect you when you come to the events, when we can show that you have a you've gone through an accreditation process on deep cleaning and sanitizing your facility. Absolutely, I like that. And then tying in with the fact that, you know, the importance of people, you said, and so there's the people side of the attendees. But there's also the importance of the frontline staff, right? And you do a lot of training of frontline staff and um, and how important and what a critical role they play. Right? Tell uh, me more about that. Oh, absolutely, Fanny. I'm going to tell you right now the most the most undervalued, sometimes underpaid, the folks that are not recognized are the most important asset, and that is the frontline staff. Frontline staff are the number one asset to any organization. They are the eyes. They are the ears of any facility in any organization. And again, sometimes undervalued, underpaid, but carry the most important responsibilities from guest services to safety and security. And now to assuring that there is total compliance to internal policies and procedures as it pertains to health precautions and compliance. So our industry is focused on the following, that all public assembly facilities should have ongoing programs of training for all staff that pertains to racial, cult, cultural, spiritual, social, and special needs issues to ensure that staff are aware of and know how to work with the diverse populations and don't perpetuate the stereotypes. That is so important. So it's it is recommended yeah. to our staff that uh, to all of the all of our different venue types that we have a program in place that trains these frontline staff members and and provide them with the ongoing competency training to recognize you know anger, the potential aggressive behavior. Um, and to monitor yeah. the verbal and nonverbal behavior as well. That's going to be critical because think about it, Fanny. We've had um, yeah. we've had people that have been quarantined and have been restricted for several months now, right? Yes, a lot and of very restless people. I'm restless. <laughs> My kids are restless. <laughs> yeah, no, so, and yeah. Now, Fanny, yeah. they're expected to comply with certain regulatory requirements and internal policies and procedures. So how are they going to react and respond to that? And how are we going to be able to communicate to reduce those levels of anxiety? Mm -hmm. And so that's where the de-escalation training is going to be so valuable and important to mm -hmm. all of the frontline staff, the number one asset. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Now, as frontline staff, they're the ones, even like outside of security, let's say, right? They're the ones you were telling me about to spot, you know, disruptive behavior and um, kind of keep their eyes open for potential safety concerns, right? Yeah, but yeah. I, you, you had a very interesting way of, of analyzing that. And, and I would love for you to share that with our audience um, of how we like spot those kind of patterns and behavior. So, so if you think about this, um, Fanny, um, we have the traditional security measures in place, right? Yeah. In all of our venues, all of our facilities. And I'll tell you this, they're great. You, you have to have them. But I, they're only a Band-Aid. But they're a much-needed Band-Aid because they stop and deter the common element or the common threat. 
right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what we need to focus on is understanding behavioral patterns that are not conducive to the environment before they ever make it through these security access points, right? Ah. We have to train teams and staff to understand what those behavioral indicators and those patterns are because before the threat crosses over to commit any type of violence, they involuntarily posture. They, they, they show the actual signs of behavioral indicators that are not conducive to that environment. And I always talk about profiling and I always, I always ask this question, Fanny, and it's interesting, especially in today's world, it's a yeah. very touchy subject, right? Yeah. But is yeah. it okay to profile? Mm. And I say, yes, it's okay to profile behavior. Mm. Behavior, behavior that is say not- Say one more time, because I think that's so important. Absolutely. It's okay to profile behavior, not people. Behavior that mm. is not conducive to the environment. The anomalous behavior that doesn't belong, yeah. you never look at, at, at ethnicity or uh, you look at the behavior and that's what you have to identify because that's what a reasonable prudent person will do. So again, is it okay to profile? Profile behavior all day long, report mm. it, identify it, report it, but not people. That's, that's the key. What does that mean? Can you give me an example of like noticing a certain behavior and, and then like, how do I make a conclusion from that? Like, so, so one of the training that we do, uh, Fanny is, I do what's called risk mitigation to guest service interjection, because mm -hmm. if you think about this, safety and security and guest services go hand in hand. If I can provide the best in customer service guest experience, if I want to know whether you are going to comply based on behavioral indicators that don't appear conducive to the environment, right, then I can interject utilizing the guest service approach and try to draw those behaviors out of you. Or I can utilize that guest service approach, right, to diffuse and remove if you have ill intent, if that makes sense. Now, so, so I'll give you an example. Now, let's just say for it, for our events, all right, let's just say it's 100 degrees outside, and I'll give you this example, and you have an individual coming in with a heavy jacket, all right? Well, how do you approach that? It's, it's unusual, right? Individual wearing a heavy jacket coming into an event, we know that heavy jackets bulked out. We know that as I sit on the, on the DHS subsector uh, coordinating council, and, and I currently chair the public assembly side, we get intel and information regarding the current threat actors, right? And one of the things that they do is, you know that the threats today, they carry uh, improvised explosive devices, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or jackets, right? So yeah. a heavy jacket, they're coming in, it's a, it's hot. That's unusual, right? Yes. That's phenomenal. So how do you approach that, right? Well, you approach it from a guest service perspective, because if they have a medical condition and there's a reason why they're wearing a heavy jacket, it's a win-win, right? Because right. you're basically telling them, hey, look, I couldn't help noticing you're wearing a heavy jacket. It's hot mm. out. And I pulled you aside and let's get you some water. Let's remove what you're doing now is you're removing them yeah. from the environment. But you're also letting them know that if you have ill intent, yeah. I've already spotted you. And a lot of time that's enough to diffuse to diffuse. Yeah. The and remove them because mm. the threat wants to carry it out, carry out uh, the, the, the actual threat successfully. But mm. if there is any resistance along the way, they will remove themselves if they can't affect the massive crowd. So here's an example of right or wrong, utilize the guest service yeah. to mitigate the risk. Oh my gosh. So it's like basically one sentence with dual purpose. So your one sentence of, you know, can I help you? Can I coat check your, your, your jacket or something Absolutely. from the guest perspective? It's being courteous and, you know, full of customer service, giving the benefit of the doubt. But at the same time, you're basically telling them, I see you. And if you're up to no good, then we're going to, we're going to manage it and kind of move you to the side, basically. That is um, Wow. Wow. <laughs> Annie, you're thinking, Ooh, heavy jacket, hot, unusual situation, yeah. uh, improvised explosive device. Now, if I walked up to the individual and said, I couldn't help notice that you're wearing a heavy jacket, which is an, yeah. you carrying an improvised explosive device, that's a trigger. That's not how you want to approach that. No, because then you're, they're going to like react, right? <laughs> In that, that usually a negative way. Yeah. That is correct. Oh, that's brilliant. Wow. Thank you. And we're getting tons of uh, comments in the feed here. Mindy says, 
This definitely needs to be taught. Uh, Rosa, knowledge and expertise from Mark is valuable for all settings and staff. Yes, indeed. Mike, absolutely correct. 15 years of leading from leading frontline IT support organizations. They are the eyes and ears of the health of the company. Absolutely. And uh, Brian was sharing profile behavior, not people. That's, I, I'm gonna remember that for a long time, Mark. That's so true. And I think it's, I think that cuts across, like you said, all, all spectrums. Right? It is. And, and the one thing uh, Fanny is training, I, I really like to harp on the training because I'll tell Please. you this, the more we train, the better prepared. Some people, they'll go into training environments and they're going to go, gosh, I got to go through this again. Well, think yeah. about it. I'm continuously re-emphasizing uh, re the training component, right? Yeah. Because if you think about this, the more training you get, the body will go where the mind has been. Mm. If the mind hasn't been there, the body won't follow. Yeah. 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 That's where the training comes into, into play, re-emphasizing the training. And you do a lot of live training, right? Like... I think you, these are some of the programs you, you do, right? And Fanny, through IVM, I've done over 300 live wow. training. Well, wow. Sports, um, all of the venue industry, um, Canada, uh, I've done them in Mexico, kind of all over, right, for IVM. And yeah. so live training has just really uh, evolved because it's better when you're doing it in person and you run them through reality-based training, mm. the training, the training. Meaning like scenarios? When you say Absolutely. that, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do scenarios. We'll do, uh, and again, the reality base is just uh, again inoculating them to those conditions you know, through a re reality based uh, setting is ideal. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, for Super Bowl staff, you know, um, I did a training. I did the situational awareness, the mindset, and then uh, we actually ran them through a full scale exercise. And and I'll tell you what, that reinforces what the response objectives are going to be. We actually utilize role players, right? So we trained some role players to actually respond a certain way so that the audience could see how you would respond given that situation and how you should and shouldn't respond. Uh, we were basically saying when we run you through these, um, these, these types of scenarios, we're taking the hesitation out of your, uh, there's no guesswork. We're gonna give you different response objectives and you get to pick which one you choose given that condition. But at least we get people to start thinking about it um, how are you going to respond to an active shooter situation? Hesitation. I always say you can't hesitate, right? So you have to have a plan of action. So can you run? Yes. Can you hide? Yes. I call it hide and hope, you know, but if you can consider yourself just long enough to remove yourself from the, the, the line of sight of the breath where you can remove yourself, that's a great thing. Or do you counter attack, right? Um, that's another option because that creates a loop reset, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get to here in a little bit, uh, uh, regarding the threat creates a little bit of hesitation, which I'll talk about here in a wow. bit. Oh my gosh. So for those of you out there in, in venues and management and, uh, even event planning and safety, you definitely need to connect with Mark Herrera, all these trainings, even just, you know, as a, as a citizen, Mark, even just knowing that there's all these systems and trainings and people out there learning and um, preparing. It's comforting. And, and I wanna thank you for, for what you do and, um, and the people that you train. Because at the end of the day, I, I'm just going to the stadium and you know having fun and you know, I'm gonna go watch a game or watch a show. And you know it, I'm oblivious to it honestly. And, but it's nice knowing that there's all these things in the background that's happening to keep us civilians safe. You know, um, Fanny, if I could add to that, this is please. really, that is so key. Everybody expects that when they go to an event, that it's a zero, it's a zero risk environment. In other words, all the risk is gone. Yeah. And that those that are, that are tasked with the responsibilities of providing those safe environments, hold that a hundred percent. And that's not the case. We, when we attend events, we have a responsibility to assure that we're vigilant in our levels of awareness. Wow. Right? We bear that responsibility as well at the end of the day, yeah. right? No one can guarantee a zero risk environment. All we can do is say, hey, we're going to give you the tools and the training to reduce the levels of severity, but it's going to be incumbent of those that are attending the, the event. 
to make sure that they're cognizant and aware of their surroundings and their environment. That is so important, right? Yeah. For their, for their survival. I will never allow myself to become so complacent mm-hmm. that, that I missed the, the train coming in from the other side. And that's what we're talking about right now with this current health pandemic is look, right now the threat is advocating to affect our vulnerability. Our vulnerability is right now we're focused on a health crisis, right? Yes. And now's the time to start affecting mass gatherings, right? How yeah. are you going to exploit those vulnerabilities when our focus is elsewhere? So what I'm doing through IVM is saying no, and all of our teams, we're focused on the security aspect as wow. well. We're going to mitigate that risk. But at the end of the day, we all bear that responsibility to protect ourselves as well. Oh, thank you for what you do. My, I mean, to make our lives safer and easier, Mark, really, really. Um, we have a question from the audience, Brian Morrison. Hey, Brian, shout out to Brian. For those of you that need a chief of staff, you need to hit him up. So, but Brian asks, what technologies do you use to help manage crowds? There's so many technologies. That, that is actually a great, that is actually a great question. But there's so many technologies out there on how you manage crowds, right? To crowd density, because crowd density is the key, especially when it comes to evacuation. You want to be able to manage that crowd density. So there are technologies out there. There's different types. But I, th- I think the most important crowd management tool out there is those that are trained in, uh, in train crowd. There's a program called Train Crowd Manager. And those are the folks that are trained on how to manage those crowds, how to effectively create those eva- evacuations. And so we advise those folks that if you've never gone through the TCM program, we highly recommend it because that's going to give you the tools that says, hey, NFPA says that that basically they highly recommend that you should have one trade crowd manager for every 250 people that are in attendance. Wow. And- facilities don't have that. So what we do is we're actively going out there through IVM with a team of, of industry experts uh, that actually push out the uh, the TCM curriculum. Wow. And, you know, I let's, I, I'm a science fiction kind of, a bit of a geek. Okay, Mark. And, um, you know, we've, when you said that, or when Brian asked that question, a little part of me like thought back to, I don't know if it was, Mission Impossible or one of Mil- Will Smith's <laughs> movies, right? And where there's like, I guess, technology to for face recognition and things like that. Is that something just, you know, still science fiction? And these days there's so much talk of like AI and artificial intelligence and things, but do those kind of technology exist right now? Or is that more stuff of the future? No, uh, Fanny, they do exist. You know, when you mm-hmm. talk about facial recognition, Facial recognition exists. Mm-hmm. Right? All of these, you can talk to your, you can talk to your, your watch nowadays, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or it's out there. All the technologies are out there, but what you've got to do is you've got to vet the appropriate technology, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I always say there's, te- like, I'll give an example, there's active shooter technologies, right? But you want to make sure that, that, uh, that they're hundred percent, there's no fault, fa- those false positives, right? That's right. So, so I always say vet the technologies that are being utilized and we currently work through IVM with an, uh, our allied community on the different technologies. We have a lot of allies that uh, that have the different types of technologies. And one of the things that we look at is are those also technology safety act designated or certified at the end, end of the day? Yeah. Because those have been vetted for for levels of effectiveness to meet that that certification, right? Uh, so, and that's important because that speaks to the, uh, the to the quality of that particular technology. I see. Gosh, thank you, Brian. Yeah, training's key, but tools support and reinforce that training. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a, I think we have a fan of yours, Mark, Denise Wilson. Thank you, Mark. Uh, The venues, the staff for all you do, education, safety, training, love and appreciate your experience, passion and purpose. Thank you, Denise. Yes, it really shows that, that you you love your work. I mean, going back to your earlier point, Mark, about passion, right? You're, you know, Fanny, it shows I, you're passionate about what you do. Well, thank you, Fanny. And, I, and I'll tell you this, you know what? One day somebody asked me this question and they said, what makes you an expert at what you do? And I said, I'm not an expert. I said, I get to see a, an expert. But if you ask me 
what makes me really good at what I do is that I've aligned myself with great people along the way throughout my career. Um, and so it allows me to go out there and deliver the message, but I deliver it with passion because when we talk about the things that we're trying to prevent and, and how we're trying to prepare our industry to protect the industry, you know, that's something that's very critical. So it, we're talking about life safety at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, so am I passionate? Yes, I've been involved in two major situations just as a law enforcement officer that I'm very fortunate to be here. I never want individuals to have to go through those situations. So if I can provide them and give them the tools that they need to mitigate that, that's a win for me. My reward is when people call me and say, hey, I encountered this situation and based on the training that we received, um, we were able to mitigate that and we were able to survive. I, that is the reward reward for me. And somebody asked me one day, they said, you've encountered so many, so many different types of situations through your law enforcement career. Um, don't you wish you could go back? And they even talk about, even, even when we talk about poor supervision, right? Because how many of us have ever had poor supervision? <laughs> no one has ever gone, right? We've all been there, right? The people like that, they says, don't you wish you could just take that away? All of the adversity that you dealt with, all of the bad situations uh, mm. and that you've encountered, I said, no, that's a gift. That's a gift that allowed me to survive. It taught me how not to do things and how to do things more effectively. Kind of like supervisors, right? Those mm -hmm. poor supervisors that, that we've all encountered at some point in time, right? Yeah. They were a gift to me because they taught me how not to be. And they taught uh, me how yes. to develop my teams effectively. And I think that's so critical and so important, including crisis. If you've been involved in crisis, guess what? That's a yeah. gift. Somebody yeah. said one day, they said, um, you know, if you've been involved in crisis, it's very traumatic. And I don't know that I can speak about it. And I said, uh, you know, when I did a training, I can't remember why I did this training, but I brought in somebody that was actually part of Harvest 91, the shooting that took place in Vegas. And I said, mm -hmm. I would love to speak to the audience as to what, how, how you managed to go through that situation, how you've recovered. Because I don't know if I could. I said, well, let me explain something to you. I said, you are a gift at the end of the day because you, mm. get, you can help others. And when yeah. I told her that, she participated and it was such an effective presentation because crisis, if you channel it right, just like 9-11, it's a gift. It's a gift that was given to us so that we can prevent that from happening to us again. Yeah. Well, I embrace the adversity in those challenges along the way. And I pass that on to my, my kiddos, right? My son, yeah. my grandkids, I pass it on to them as well. And it's yeah. funny, I want to share this with you, uh, Fanny. Yeah. Because when we were talking about awareness a while ago, I, I meant to bring this up. But I have two grandkiddos, right? Yeah. Uh, Maylee and Kehlani. We uh -huh. three and six. They just three and six a year ago. And oh. so I'll tell you this. They are so aware of their surroundings. I'll ask one of them. I'll say, hey, Maylee, what's your head on? A swivel, G. Paul. That means that she has a 360 <laughs> a view of her entire world. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, show me your six. What's your six? And she'll look back, right? So she'll look behind her. That's wow. her six. I'm looking at the face of a clock, six is behind you. Yeah. And I'll say, what are you looking for, Maylene? And she'll say, Gee, Paul, I'm looking for suspicious behavior. This is a six year old that's able to tell me this. Oh my gosh. So You've trained me well. <laughs> Gee, Paul is, is proud. <laughs> well, I'm very proud. Most definitely, Danny. Oh, I love that. Oh, um, oh, we have an interesting question from Jim Ramsbottom. What about times when the unknown situation has such a great potential reward that it is worth taking the risk? Oh, I'd be curious what you're thinking of, Jim. Going with your gut and trusting your instincts. I think right? that's important instinctively. Yeah. Sometimes we have to make split second decisions and we don't know if it's the right decision. But yeah. I always say when you make the decision, if you make the decision with good intent, mm. intentions, right, we can yeah. always manage the outcome. But yeah. sometimes you have to make decisions and we're afraid to make them at that given moment. Well, because so, they're unfamiliar to us, right? To your it's, earlier point. It's the unknown that makes us very, it makes it very challenging for us to actually step up and make those decisions during those critical moments. That's correct. Mm. Awesome. That's a great question. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, you and I got into a conversation around the conscious and subconscious mind, right? What we're aware of, and then what we just kind of instinctively do, or we're not even aware of happening. Um, I, I want to dive into that a bit more. So 
what please share about that absolutely two parts of the mind the conscious the subconscious part of the mind as i mentioned before the subconscious part of the mind stores information bad but the cool thing about it it's always subject to recall here's the thing intuitively our intuition is speaking to us we all have that we all hear that little voice inside us that says something isn't right or something doesn't feel right most yes. of the time we ignore it what that is is a subconscious mind picking up what the conscious mind can't see right so we have to pay attention to that investigate that when you feel uncomfortable about something and that little voice is just screaming something isn't right investigate it all right because we're missing it's you know what? I always say err on the side of caution. Yeah. Again, that's so important. That's why I say program the subconscious mind through training and wow. reinforce that training over and over and over again. And I'll give you an example, Fanny, is a uh, training from a very critical standpoint that I, I don't really share this with a lot of people. So yeah. you'll be one of the first in your audience, really. That yeah. But I've been a major shooting, right? And here's mm. the thing. Um, I, was always, I was always trained to mentally prepare before I ever approach a situation, right? Start visualizing and what the response objectives are going to be. And I always realized what it was going to be like going to a situation where somebody would shoot, shoot at me from a window. Yeah. Believe me, I always thought about that because I'm, we're always approaching homes, right? Yeah. And the day came, right? Oh. It, actually, it happened. It happened and I survived, right? That's the cool thing about it. I survived the situation, but if I, but I was always in those training sessions and I was one of those guys that sat in there and going, gosh, I got to go through this again. Holy cow. Right. And it became repetitive, but it mm. became conditioned in me that automatically when I encountered that situation, I didn't have to put a, there was no thought process. I reacted and responded immediately, survived the situation where if I hadn't, I wouldn't mm. be on your show today, Fanny. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like how, how do you, how do you live with that, Mark, in terms of how do you, I would think that being in those situations and obviously always being prepared, but do you ever get to a point where your brain can't rest and, and it's because it's on hyperdrive, right? Got to be prepared. You're thinking of the 101 scenarios that could happen. At what point do you kind of have to say, okay, <laughs> my brain has to rest and like, do you get to that point? I'm, I'm very curious. Like, I am so relaxed in the different conditions that I'm involved in because I've been exposed to them. Uh, I'm more relaxed that way than had I not received the tools. Sally Bennix just said it best, uh, you know, in her feed there. Yeah. Memory. I have created so much muscle memory with the things uh, in the training that yeah. I'm confident that if if I encounter something, I have probably been exposed to that in some form or fashion. I that it, it gives me the comfort in responding to it. So I don't walk around paranoid going, I wonder if this is going to happen. No. I know that when the condition presents itself, that mm -hmm. I have most likely been exposed to it that allows me to actually respond effectively to that condition. Yeah. And hence, preparedness beats paranoia. <laughs> Did yeah. you see? I looped it around. <laughs> that was good, Patty. That was great. Uh, actually, speaking of loop, right? Uh, you you mentioned earlier about this this loop decision making. I want to touch on that. So the key to survival. This is the key right here. All right, Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd. For those of you that are part of the audience today, know who he is. He was a uh, he was a military commander that utilized this process. It's the decision making process that we go through every single day. It's called the the loop. It's called the OODA loop. It stands for observation, orientation, decision, and action. And that's a process that you take every, every time you make a decision to, some, to do something, you make an observation of your condition and you orientate yourself to those conditions. And then you make a decision as to what type of action you're gonna take. That's the entire decision-making process. Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd used that in air-to-air -air combat to counter and control the adversary at the end of the day. But it's very applicable to civilian life because the way you apply it here, the way you apply it here is, think about this. Anytime you make an observation to do something, when you go do that, you've orientated yourself to those conditions that you're potentially going to encounter. Right. And you made that decision of what type of action you're going to take. But if all of a sudden you enter that environment and it's a whole different observation that you never expected to see, well, Fanny, you can't orientate yourself to the new condition quick enough to yeah. control. 
So therefore, your loop has been reset. That's what creates the hesitation and the complacency. And from a threat perspective, I always say that the threat goes through that same process, right? They've made an observation of the condition of their environment. They've orientated themselves to that condition. So imagine this, the example I can give, let's, active shooting was really huge and it's, it's, it's big, right? I mean, it, yeah. it's, it is by the year, right? Well, if you think about this, the threat has made an observation of the environment that he wants the to The threat affect. meaning the person threatening somebody, right? The person is threatening yeah. somebody else. Right? Okay. So if you give the threat an observation that he never intended to see, guess what? A whole different condition. And think about what the threat doesn't expect to see. If you give him that, he hesitates. And it creates a little bit of a lull in the action that allows you to control your environment. It allows you to remove yourself or it allows an individual to counter the attack. Right? So what would be something that he's not, he or she is not expecting? What would well, the threat be? If you think about this, most of the threats today, it's a hard concept, you know, but I always say you have a few options in a threatening environment, especially an active shooter situation. Yeah. Run, hide, fight, or evade, shelter, and barricade, right? Those are your options. But the one thing that the threat doesn't say expect, that again, because I, I want people to really run what? You can uh, DHS, you know, that's their model. Run, hide, and fight. That's, that's run, an option. Run, hide, mm -hmm. and fight. Okay. But I also use evade, shelter, and barricade. Evade, you want to evade, shelter, yourself. and barricade. Evade Correct. Shelter. Ah, okay. Evade, barricade. So, so you want to rem try to remove yourself from that environment. But if you can't, and you're within close proximity from a threatening situation or a threat, you may only have one option, right? Mm -hmm. And that is to counter the attack, right? Mm -hmm. But if you make that decision quickly to counter the attack, right? Mm -hmm. What that does is the threat never expects that, right? Yeah. So, that creates a little bit of hesitation that allows you to close the gap to control that environment. And so that's one of the training sessions that we do. And we run that through an actual full scale exercise. Wow. We have a question in the audience. Um, I think Mindy, Mindy was curious when you, in that situation, when you were shot at, like, how did you, what did you do to survive? How did you, how did you get out of that? That, Mindy, that's a great question. Um, mm. I, it's uh, We eliminated the threat, or let's just say the threat was eliminated. Mm. Uh, uh, immediately, I reacted and responded to the condition by simply moving my head back because the weapon was pointed at my face. So I just moved my oh head my back gosh. and the round went under underneath, literally underneath my chin, right? Holy smokes. So it was a win. I'm getting goosebumps, Mark. <laughs> oh, my God. And wow. so we then eliminated the threat, you mm. know, and, uh, and all's well ends well. So, yeah. so yeah. I, and again, somebody says, does that bother you? I say, no, it's a, it's a gift. I can give it back to you now. Right. So yeah. I don't think it affect me. Wow. Brian says he's curious what your top strength is. Have you ever done the Gallup top five strengths? I have not. A fan oh, of I'd be curious about those results too. Okay. I'll send you the link. <laughs> You basically go through a 20-minute uh, questionnaire, and, and it shows what your top five strengths are. And like strengths in terms of, you know, whether you're analytical or you're a relator or you're competitive or um, an analyzer. So it, it's a very, very cool exercise. And they always say your strengths are what you naturally can do even when you're tired and exhausted and grumpy, like you, you can still pull those out of you um, to be effective. Now, who um, asked that, Fanny? Who, who Brian. Asked well, Brian, let me tell you something, Brian. First of all, I, I can tell you what my weaknesses are. <laughs> okay, let's go there. <laughs> you know, my weakness is I don't like to fail, right? Mm. But adversity and failure sometimes is really good, right? Yeah. I can also tell you that I don't make really good decisions sometimes, in lax environments, ah. but when I have to make a decision now in a critical environment, sometimes those are my best decisions. You know, yeah. if you ask me what I'm going to eat for for dinner today, I will procrastinate that until nine o'clock. <laughs> you know. Do you go through a loop? <laughs> right, loop of indecision. <laughs> um, oh, here's let's see. Mark asks. Are there any exercises to help people learn to live in the moment 
which in some aspects aligns with situational awareness. Ah, so meaning that instead of being caught up in our own thoughts, I Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but like instead of being caught up in our own thoughts to being really present and being really aware of our situation. I want you, that's a really good question. We are so caught up and consumed right now with a technology, right? Yeah. And if you think about all the, all the kiddos out there today, look at what they're doing. They're so caught up. Yeah. They're caught up in the technology that they're completely unaware of their surroundings. And, and, and so we're caught up in the moment. We're so preoccupied that we're, we're missing everything around us. And that's the one thing that I like to train is look, don't walk around in a fog as Mark Reynolds just said. <laughs> don't be oblivious to what's going on. Yeah. That is so that is so critical. I got have two granddaughters that that are not in the fog. They're they're pointing out suspicious behavior My as goodness. we're walking around at Disneyland, right? Yeah. That's how that's how fine-tuned they are. So so here's a great example. I have an education manager. He's awesome, right? Yeah. Um, his name is Greg Wolf. I'll put his name out there and he just, he's just an asset to the entire industry as well. Yeah. And I will tell you this, that we go into Starbucks sometimes and, and he's my education manager. So we go in there and I said, I want you to take a look, Greg, do you see a problem here? And he goes, no, everything's fine. While well, he's got both of his earbuds on, right. <laughs> he's holding about six conference calls at one time. And I said, yeah. hey, I want you to look around. Is there a problem here? Uh, hold on. Let me, you can't even hear me. I said, you see, he, I said, everybody's consumed with their technology today. No one is aware of their environment. I said, if you don't think the threat has already done pre-operational threat surveillance at some of the facilities to know who's in tune with their environment and who's not, you got to think again, because that's, that's taking place right now as we speak. So you need to be cognizant and aware and not get caught up in what you're doing that we, that we miss the elephant in the room. That's so critical and so important. And again, that's also part of that training that that we roll out on the awareness piece. Man, it's like uh, I'm a huge movie buff, Mark, and uh, it's. I think we recently watched uh, Jason Bourne, and I, I still remember. I think the very first uh, first episode or first movie, he would say like, because he had amnesia, right? And then, but he said he can go into a room and notice who's doing what and what's on the wall and who's talking to who <laughs> is that how your brain works mark <laughs> i immediately when i walk into a room or a facility i have already done a complete assessment so i've already looked at my exit points right I, if i have to exit and evacuate i know which way i'm going to go wow. and i always know that there could be a secondary threat as well and i've already had I already have a plan of action for that as well wow. so I don't sit in the middle of a room. I don't sit up at the front. I sit mm. near, near an exit where I can remove myself if I have to, but I can also scan the room for that anomalous behavior. Um, uh, yes. We've had church shootings, right? There's been several church. Yeah. Shootings. And when I watch the video footage, if you'd have been sitting at the very back, you're going to see the behavior that is the, uh, the involuntary posturing and body posturing that takes place when it, right before an individual crosses over uh, wow. to come Act and, and you can see it. I mean, it's plain as day. That at least allows you some time to remove yourself and take as many people as you can with you before it ever escalates. All right. So I've already done a complete assessment of a room uh, before I even before I even sit down, Fanny. And it's it's not it's just instinctively done. And, yeah. and I'll tell you who's a master at it is my son. Ah. My son is a master. He can go can, in there. He, can he tell me how many vases I have in my room? <laughs> he, he may be able to. He may yeah. be able to. Uh, but he, wow. kind of at it. he can sit in the room wow. and look at the room and he can say, Dad, I, you know, you have two exits, one at your nine, one at your three, kind of a clock face. He can tell you, you know, um, hey, Dad, what's wrong with this picture? You got two individuals at your at your four o'clock. How does it? They don't look right. Why do they? And then I'll have him explain why. What, what's different about it? About mm -hmm. the so he's doing those assessments as we go along, as we go into those types of environments. And it's just become very common practice for us. I play a game with my granddaughters already. Uh -huh. And you're going to die. When I, I, I had to check with a child psychologist on this one. But <laughs> really good. 
We're, 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 what are you raising? <laughs> who are you raising? Oh my God, they're so awful. The next spy. <laughs> this is very funny, but I, I we play an active shooter game. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, this is how it goes. All right, before your audience freaks out, I need to give them the explanation. We'll sit down at the table and I'll clap and I'll point. Shots fired, right? Because that's the new norm within the schools now, all right? You're having these active shooter situations take place in the schools. So I'll clap and I'll point. Well, I point towards the direction where the shooter is at. They, when they went in wherever we're at together, they've already spotted their exits that they'll immediately take off and go out the exit when I do that. And then I'll go out and get them and bring them back in. I'll clap, point, they run to the exits. And it's amazing to watch. And one day, you know, my son said, Dad, you got to let him eat. We were eating at a restaurant. I oh, my gosh. One of took off running to the exit. Dad, seriously, you got to let him eat. But here's the thing. I would rather give them the tools to be prepared with what's the new norm, right, than they sit, get caught on their heels, and not have a plan of action at the end of the day. So for me, it's about – giving them a plan of action so they respond and there's no thought process behind it. They will be directing emergency responders into the school if that ever happens, not if, when it happens, if that makes sense. Oh, Mark, I mean, on one hand, a part of me is, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great to be prepared. And then, um, but I think a little part of me, like my heart just breaks that, um, that we have to be that kind of prepared. It's unfortunate, Fanny, but yeah, yeah. we do. And I just, uh, through IVM, I yeah. did a presentation for the D Dallas Independent School District as well, because there for a while you had a lot of folks thinking, well, you know, in particular our politicians, they were saying that, you know, the fix for the active shooter situations within the schools is not exercise the students. Well, not true. You want, if you think about it, you have less fire drills than you do active shooter situations, but we drill for fires all the time. So you have to drill with what the new norm is, right? So drill the students, right? You know, that's, that's so important. The other thing was that, you know, um, you know, that gun control is, was huge. You know, there was a lot of discussions on gun control, maybe long term, but, but I'll tell you what, in Texas, you can break into any car out here and you're going to find a weapon, right? There's weapons all over the place. It really isn't the fix. So what we did was we developed, I developed, put a program together that says, hey, we need to let the students be the advocates within their own within their own schools, within their own district to identify what the risks are. And let's identify what, what that program looks like. So we wanted them to own the program. And so we built, developed the program and we rolled it out to, to the Dallas Independent School District. The great thing about this was when we rolled it out uh, at American Airlines Center, who hosted this, we did the mindset. And when we rolled that training out, we let them you know, I worked with, uh, you know, a couple of the the, uh, the team leaders to develop the you know, within their workshops to develop this program so that they could own it. And when we rolled out the program, here was the win. Uh, they, they um, we had about seven to 8,000 students that were bust for the program. And what happened was that the win was after the program was, uh, was uh, executed, um, I received a call from a reporter that says, I just want to let you know that one of the schools in Texas was targeted for an active shooter situation, but it was prevented and they attributed the program at the end of the day. So I'm like, wow, wow. if the program, if the program uh, was that effective that students were able to survive and uh, the next day on a potential active shooter situation, then that was yeah. a win. And so yeah. I attached itself to that and, and we led that, we led that program. In Prevention, the yeah. Students are part of our, of, of the venue industry. Yeah. Yeah, Brian says, you know, he agrees he wants to wallow in ignorance, but it's amazing to learn these things from Mark. Yes, I. that's why I, I when I first, for, for all of you in the audience, when I first started talking to Mark, I, it just kind of like blew my mind that there's all these things. I know they're happening in the world, but at the same time, it's comforting to know there's all these measures and um, things to mitigate it and prevent it. And um, like you said, training. Um, so it's, thank you. Like I, I'm at, I'm at a little loss for words actually, Mark. So yeah. Well, Fanny, thank I, it's, you. it's truly, truly my pleasure. And if you think about this, um, you know, one of the most important things and 
you know, and I, I share this, it's part of the Department of Homeland Security campaign as well as see, say, do, right? We talk about if you see something, say something, but most importantly, do something about it, right? That's so important. Yeah. And that was, uh, that was the theme of the program that we ran, that we rolled out with DISD. And that is something that we advocate without the, with the entire uh, venue and event industry is don't sit on information because I always say, and as I told the students, you can't unring a bell. Mm. In other words, if you sit on information, once the bell rings, guess what? You can't unring that bell. Yeah. You know? So don't sit on the information. Get it out there. Mm -hmm. Err on a side of caution. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So I mean, time just flies. <laughs> but I, I want to I want to bring it all back to your earlier point that it's it's all about the people. Right. And you and I got into a discussion around the importance of empathy. Right. At the end of the day, we're you're in the business of protecting people. And um, tell me how empathy comes into that. Fanny, empathy is important because it helps us understand how others are feeling so that we can respond appropriately to their situation. Yeah. If I'm able to understand what you are thinking and feeling, then I'm able to respond appropriately to whatever the situation may be. We want to be able to communicate Fanny to others in a way that makes sense to them, especially when it comes to compliance. I've trained, I don't know how many officers and frontline staff within the venue industry. And the one thing that I say that when you are challenged by someone being non-compliant, you don't want to take it personal. It's not a personal attack against you. It's merely challenging what you represent. And that's the authority figure. Mm -hmm. So take things personal. That's when our personal biases affect our ability to make good sound judgment and decisions to help others. Empathy is so critical. It is so important. And we have to be able to see it from the other perspective, right? That's how we're going to get an understanding as to how we're going to assist them and communicate resolve at the end of the day. And I think that that's so important, especially in today's times with, with the protests help happening and the challenges around that, right? Oh, Fanny, and let's think about, talk about the protests. If you yeah. want to, we can go there. Cause I, I'll tell you this, the protests. So every, every American has a right to reasonably exercise their first amendment. Right. Right. Yeah. We know that there's injustice out there that has taken place. Right. Yeah. But we can't hold everybody accountable to that injustice because there's some really great police officers out there that, mm -hmm. that are doing such a, a great job. Right. Um, I know of several officers out there that, that have done, they have made some sacrifices. But here's the thing, as a protester, they have a right to reasonably protest, exercise. Yes. And I love the fact that there's agencies that are supporting that, right? Yeah. They're supporting that. But what's happening is that you have the anarchists that are attaching themselves. These are the ones that are loitering, they're, they're affecting businesses and, and local communities, and they're skewing the message. If I want to reasonably get a message across, right? And I'm affecting, and I have these anarchists that are attaching themselves to the protests, and they're affecting these 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 folks that these businesses and these business owners that understand the injustice. Now these business owners are going to be looking at protest protesters as one. They're going to say, "Well, yeah. wait, I see the injustice," and not separating the issues. Mm -hmm. You got to separate that. That's correct. So, mm -hmm. so if you think about this, and then under COVID, I wanted to bring this up, Fanny, because some of the interviews that I've done, they said. What are the dangers of having these protests right now under the current health conditions? You think about this. If you're emotionally attached to an event such as a protest, you know, that six foot recommended distance is not far enough. Right. Yeah. Would you contract COVID being that close in that type of environment? Absolutely. You're endangering yourself. So mm -hmm. place yourself in that situation. And that's that's so critical. But again, uh, people don't think logically and reasonably when they have a heart rate spike. And they suffer again. The physical think, side of it, right? All the physical sides, cognitive impairment, uh, motor skill degradation, right? They suffer. Um, they suffer tunnel vision, right? Mm. They're in that. And somebody, I can't remember who it was. They called it the fog. That's exactly what it is. Is it? It's, it's a fog. So you want to remove yourself from the anarchist, anarchist approach to uh, to these uh, protests that are taking place. Yeah. Well, Mark. Thank you. I mean, it is, uh, I think you've blown <laughs> my mind continually. And at the same time, like just <laughs> Mindy says, 
really need to process all the information you told us. So do I, Mindy. <laughs> Denise says, thank you. Awesome show. Yes, yes. I mean, like, it's, yeah, Mark, thank you. Like, um, I want to, there's so much more we could talk about, but for those of you out there, you know, make sure you connect with Mark and uh, you can find him on LinkedIn um, and also go visit IAVM.org, International Association of Venue Managers, and uh, definitely connect with this, this wonderful man here. Um, but uh, Mark, I always like to kind of wrap things up with, with a gratitude practice. I think at the end of the day, despite everything, I, I'm a person of hope. I'm a person of positivity, and um, and I always want to practice gratitude. So these days, Mark, what are what are you most grateful for? You know, I'm I'm really grateful uh, for the the folks out there that are allowing me to share my knowledge and mm -hmm. the level of expertise that I do have to assist them uh, in the things that we've discussed today. But I'm I'm really you know. I'm, I'm really grateful for obviously the support that I've received, obviously from the entire industry um, and, and obviously my family, you know, yeah. that's key. You know, the yeah. support, uh, the, uh, you know, the family support is key. That's critical. So yes. I'm very thankful for that as well. Um, what I do want to say is that I want every, first of all, I want to thank you, Fanny, because oh. <laughs> you do such a great job and I got to watch you on the Jeff Criley show. Uh, yeah, delivered such an. I mean, you did such a great job there during the interview, and you're impacting a lot of people with what with. I mean, just through your show alone, mm. you're you're helping others enhance their brand as well, and uh, and that thank speaks. You. Hard. So thank you for what you do, <laughs> and and I just want to say thank you for having me here, and I want everybody to know that you. Uh, I want you to stay engaged, keep all of your your family. Keep all of those that you supervise and those that you work with, keep them engaged as well because they're so, they're so important during these critical times and know that we're going to power through this and we're going to be better than we've ever been before. And if I can ever assist any one of you, uh, I think Fanny put me out there. Yeah. I'm really happy to, to help anyone uh, in, in the audience. So Definitely thank you. connect with Mark, everyone. Mark Herrera. Thank you, Mark. And as we wrap up, I want to remind all of you Never, ever forget to shine your light. We each have a gift. We each have a message. We each have an impact on the world. And I hope you share it with the world through video. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mark. So appreciate your time. And uh, everyone out there, have a great rest of your week and weekend. And enjoy your time with family and friends. Bye now. Bye, everyone.